All right, good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Live the Fuel show. So this evening it is currently uh, five, no, just after 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here, north of Philadelphia, west of New York City, and good old Allentown, Pennsylvania. And we're recording on a Monday because um, a lot of people don't look forward to Mondays, but I do. I crush a lot of work on a Monday. I tell people all the time, it's all about mindset. And uh, we may dig in a little about mindset today, maybe even a little bit about personality. There's a little teaser for you because your personality does drive many things. And uh, you'll find out why in a second because my guest co-host connecting up with us today brings 20 years of unsuccessful cold call selling. That's right. I have years of sales and marketing background and I know what it's like. And I tell people all the time, cold call selling is not just business. You do it in dating, you do it in romance, you do it in school. Maybe you did it to your parents when you lied and you crashed the car into the side of the garage. <clears throat> Personal story. <laughs> but heck, let me give you a little more about this guy. He decided to throw out everything and take a fresh approach after those 20 years of unsuccessful practice. Now, he drew on his degree in philosophy and he invented a groundbreaking approach to personal inquiry that revealed a person's life motivation. And you know, if you've listened to the show for a while, I care a lot about motivation and inspiration that drives us, uh, but also the, the, the authentic design far beyond sales. So he's the CEO of Authentic Systems, educates on using practical and teachable methods and techniques based on European psychology. And you guys know that I'm a psych geek because I studied it. And he guides others in their life's choices regarding success or failure in the career, in relationships, and as I hinted, personal well-being. So without further ado, your new guest co-host today is John Voris, and he's the author of Discover the Power That Drives Your Personality, How Four Virtues, Four People, Define Your World, Love, Justice, Wisdom, Power. We're going to dig into all that today. So John, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you for having me. It's very exciting. Yeah. So uh, am I correct in, in clarifying, because I just got done recording two other podcasts this past weekend, uh, and actually they were newbies, complete noobs, never been on a podcast before. You've actually been on a few others. So. Oh, sure. Yes. But I, I must say I have to do a little correction, unfortunately. What I did is I successfully cold called for 20 years. Oh, successfully? Even better. Yes. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe a typo was sent your way. So I well, you, you got a team behind you. So yeah, uh, yeah. that makes it even more better then. Because actually, here's the funny thing, though. I actually like to play on the words because a lot of people understand that actually in cold calling and selling, there is unsuccess in the beginning. A lot of oh, people, sure. a lot of people, especially intro, well, newbie salespeople, even myself at one time, they don't understand the, understand the power of follow-up. <laughs> but to your point, getting to know people and trying to dig deep and find their, their inspiration or their motivation behind everything they do will get you closer in a shorter sales cycle or a shorter relationship building process. Because uh, I run sales for a, a friend of mine, a, cl a client who's also a friend of mine, and I train her people. And that's one thing I always drive people. I'm like, guys, like, your sales cycle is only as long as the relationship you decided to build. So what are your thoughts on that little tag, tag line I just threw out there? Well, the type of cold calling I did was um, uh, just literally door-to-door -door, uh, sales. I would sell, above all things, food, door-to-door. Oh, okay. -door. Okay. Yes. Food. Yes. See, that's, that's more common nowadays. People get their food yeah. delivered to their house and everything else. But was that like one of those steak companies or – yeah, uh, very close. Yes, it's. Um, I would knock on your door, introduce myself, and say, "Have you ever seen one of our products?" You'd say, "No," and I'd say, w a "Wait a minute." I give you a brochure, <laughs> and I go out into my car, and believe it or not, I'd bring you a ham. Oh. And I set, set the ham down on your table, and I would talk about what I have, and you'd read the brochure and make an order, and it comes next week. You walked in with a ham. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. That's that's. <laughs> that's 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 in your face product your face. presentation so, oh yeah so no oh, yeah. flip no flip book no brochures no. well no, no i had a brochure i okay. had just one sheet one sheet okay no. prices yeah 
I do like the one sheet thing. Simplicity no. is sometimes better. There's, there's no. depending on the business you're in, people got the flip books. They've got nowadays they put it, now they put the digital flip book. They have you swiping on an iPad and everything. And I'm like, let's just cut to the chase. Like, what do you got? Right. You know, like, yeah. what are we going to do? I got it. <laughs> so, what I did though is uh, uh, when I, I was uh, at Berkeley and I needed a part time job and I tried uh, door to door cold call sales and failed seven times in a row. First four times I was fired. Next three times I quit because I so I wouldn't go through the humiliation. So I thought I was done with uh, sales altogether. Mm. But then I did notice that in the area of communication, very little is taught. Uh, my degree was in philosophy, and I focused on language. I noticed that in, in the topic of language is so huge. The books that are written would fill a modest bookstore. So you yeah. get an idea of in sales training how little is really taught in communication. But anyway, everyone else around me benefited. I want to make that very clear. These workshops, seminars do work. Mm -hmm. I slipped through the cracks. Okay. So I left it and I bought a, I graduated and bought, bought a delicatessen. And then when I sold it, one of my suppliers came to me and said, would you like to sell for me? And I said, well, fine, but we were going to do wholesale. When yeah. you do wholesale, you've got everything fixed. Your grocery stores, delicatessens. So you've got your See, now you're talking my game. Buyers. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. totally get that because my biggest client, she's a HVAC, heating and air conditioning industry representation firm. So manufacturers, instead of hiring their own salespeople, they will outsource to sales rep firms who control the territory. So she has the sure. whole Northeast here, U.S., and yeah, they, the primary meetings, I sit down on her behalf with CEIOs of very large distribution wholesale uh, companies mm -hmm. and help mm -hmm. her company, you know, basically close deals for her clients, which are big multi-million dollar right. you know, manufacturers. So. Yeah, and they need each other. So uh, when you're cold calling door to door to just uh, residents, people, uh, it's a different story. You've got to create the need, mm. the money and everything else. So uh, I, I decided I'll go ahead and uh, work for him because I'd already bought his product line. But then uh, when my deli was in escrow, he filed bankruptcy. Oh, that's not good. And I hadn't looked for another job. And he said, don't worry about it, John. We're going to start the way the business uh, began 50 years ago with door-to-door -door cold call sales. All right. So now I'm facing seven attempts, seven failures. Did you and cringe? Huh? <laughs> I was like, did you cringe when he said oh, that? Oh, that was terrifying. I mean, I had, uh, now I have a wife and child to support and I am, fa and she didn't work. And I'm faced with seven years, seven attempts at um, uh, failure. Wow. So w what I did is I decided I'm going to start this all over again because it didn't work for me. And I went straight to the philosophy of language and okay. I learned what symbolism means and how symbolism works. And you see everything in your, in your space, in your office, represents a prior decision. Not an imaginary idea, not something you wish, but something that in fact occurred. Hmm. Everything behind you in your office is tethered to your identity. Absolutely. If it's tethered to your identity, why not read the objects and find out who you are? Mm-hmm. I mean, perfect example, I mean, people listening to this, we are recording video because uh, we always, you know, post this on Facebook and LinkedIn or and actually Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. But one of the things behind me, that frame is one, is my family name from Ireland. So the entire history of my family lineage, which, you know, stems back to Northern Ireland. And, and the other one is, uh, is my degree, you know, uh, marketing and psychology. And then in the middle actually is actually the logo of this show because one of my fans made that out of wood. <laughs> so it was a very nice gift uh, from, from a fan and listener. So, Well, yeah, normally when, well, in, in America, when mm -hmm. you think about symbols, you do look at that as a symbol. Uh, sometimes it's a logo. Uh, it's a football team logo, baseball, et cetera. So that's kind of when I ask people to describe uh, symbols, that's what they'll tell me. They run about 20 ideas and they kind of slow down. Hmm. But now look from a European perspective, everything with a name is a symbol, okay. which means your carpet's a symbol, your door's a symbol, your, your uh, blinds are a symbol, the color of your walls is symbolized. Your blinds are a symbol? Oh, absolutely. Everything around you oh. symbolizes who you are together. Okay. Together now, keep that in mind. Together. Yeah. yeah. So, so they're bundling all of this. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I couldn't look at your blinds and say I know who you are. Okay. 
so I take it all in together. So uh, th there is similarities. And so um, uh, this is how I read people for 20 years. Hmm. Then what I would do is I would read the objects behind you and, and language what I'm selling toward what I'm seeing. So okay. what would happen is I would become a symbol that conforms to you. My object I'm selling would uh, conform to you. And that would, that would generate a need that you would want it. So hmm. my sales was 12 to 14 out of 20. Cold call, door to door, say, yeah, very, very high. But, but I do teach that. But then moving forward, what I wanted to do is I wanted to get some idea of if, if there's some archetypes that I could use to make it simpler to teach people. And so through uh, the studies of anthropology, uh, I discovered there are four themes that run throughout a shamanic uh, descriptions of uh, human themes. And they're usually a warrior, teacher, uh, visionary, uh, and, and they're consistent. That's what's important. Uh, and I, I, also, I want to pause on that because yeah. uh, I never even, I've heard the word before, but we never really heavily talked about archetypes. And I've been, I got over 300 shows online, but until way, way, way back, way back on episode 89, we have over 300 on, but a, a, a woman came on, her name was uh, Kylie Slavic. That's right. And she led with archetypes and mm -hmm. their impact on storytelling in relation yeah. to life sales and marketing. So mm -hmm. I, I haven't talked about archetypes in a while and I'm love that you're hitting on this. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when I say the word cat, you have an image, an idea. And that mm -hmm. idea, in a sense, is an archetype. Then you have the specific cat. That's the difference. Okay. And that, that, so we don't mix cats and dogs together, right? So that's archetypes are ideas or images. And it, and it keeps everything separate. And that's what uh, makes things function in a human mind. In fact, there are many who believe that we could not think without archetypes. So we would you say that... Feel. It's, it's about establishing that kind of like direct association, right? Like you just said, like if I, if I, you said cat, I, am, I immediately think of, actually, I told, I can tell you, I thought of actually one or two or three different cats that all of my mm -hmm. friends have, because sure. obviously if I'm around them and I'm a dog guy, so if I'm around a cat, I must be a close friend or a family member who has these cats because I'm, because I don't, I'm not around cats normally. So, but I thought of those people because of the cat. <laughs> <laughs> So there's like three layers of connection right there. Sure, sure. So uh, uh, the more modern version is uh, love, justice, wisdom, and power. But in European psychology, it's the motivation to be, to belong, uh, to know, and to be in action. Hmm. They're all, they all correspond. So, uh, so I felt I had something. So okay. what I did is I took that information and wove them together with what I discovered in uh, generating archetypal patterns and found they worked. So now I teach people about their theme, which is going to be either love, justice, wisdom, or power. But now love uh, covers a huge area from caring to oh, love, yeah. from relationship to justice, yep. from curiosity to knowing. And oh, there's from friendships, change, family, yeah. you yes. know, direct yes. fr close friends, and lots of friends. It, it's funny you're bringing all this up because since you studied psychology, um, I, I mildly minored in it, but one thing that always stuck with me and it's come up throughout the show and I'm I want to see how you connect on this is uh, I remember studying and it always stuck with me about life balance. And they discussed that in psychology, depending on what school of psychology you study, right? I never really dug into the European, so I'm super excited about this today. Um, they said, on average, the person can usually reflect on about five to six domains of their life and you can narrow them down to love is one depending on you know how diverse you want to go with love uh you have the wisdom or the the, the thought process because you know your education for example uh, like sure. when we, if, if you go to the university right there uh you have your career and your profession and then there's friendships and then there's a, a few other domains but the point is one thing that stuck with me was it's very hard for people to balance all of those domains and keep them all at the same level or at a top peak performance throughout life. You're going to have some drop below that zero axis, right? And then come flying back up again. Like when you're in school, obviously school is important. When you're building your career, obviously your career is important. 
And that the whole point of the, of the thing that stuck with me was realize this, be aware of this. And it's okay if some of these drop down, but be aware because that's why a lot of people are led into you know, divorce and relationship issues or career issues because they start letting the other domains rise up and they forget to try and keep them balanced. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts around all that? Because obviously you're narrowing it down to four and then getting people to one. And I, I, I came from a world of like trying to focus on those five to six and always keep aware of them. Well, uh, I, I understand that's a, a very uh, typical American version. Aha, okay. Very important, American version. So uh, when, when I woke up this morning, uh, first thing you go through your normal routine, but it's a routine that you know, right? And I was thinking about, I have a podcast today, so I'm gonna be in relationship with someone. Mm -hmm. okay. I want to be able to be prepared a little bit back to knowing. Okay. And uh, I want to make sure that I deliver uh, something that's actionable that ah. will that help change people. And out of that, I get a sense of uh, uh, well-being. A per personal well-being. Yes. Okay. So, so in your, in our daily life, your daily life, mine and every listener, you cannot, cannot escape love, justice, wisdom, and power, walking to the store, okay? okay? Brushing your teeth, you can't do it. Meaning that they're all always present or they're that you're gonna present. hit on one of them? You're gonna have a dominant one. So okay. if you're a justice person, you're gonna always look at love from a sense of duality. Uh, wisdom is a sense of duality and power as a sense of duality, but you're really gonna be hyper, um, focused on what's fair, just in the world, back mm. to that duality, relationship, that's what you're going to focus. And this is what I discover is uh, everyone has that dominant theme that runs their whole life. So uh, yeah, uh, so another way of looking at it is you go to the faucet and the water comes out and it's dark. So you know, this is not healthy, that's your love. Then you say this, there's something wrong, that's your justice. Somebody must know what's going on. There's your wisdom. I'm going to make a call, which is your power. Hmm. Okay? You can't escape it. Those four is with you all the time. Everything else is a process or a tool. This sounds powerful because obviously I'm a, I geek out about psychology because I've I studied it. So, and obviously running a podcast, like I've had psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, sure. you name it on this show. And I've even dabbled in other forms. For example, I'm sure you're familiar with the classic, the five love languages yeah. and the power mm -hmm. of figuring that part out of your life. So you know how you communicate and your significant other. So there's so many different, and I'll be intrigued to see how you want to word it, but the domains of psychology, like okay. you just like today you're establishing American versus European, which is super cool. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But you literally get people narrowed down to figure out one of those four. So you're, you're going yeah. from four down to one. And that's yes. usually going to carry consistently throughout the life? Absolutely. Wow. And so uh, the other I discovered through European studies, the human mind only has one need. And that mm -hmm. is the perpetual need to express your authentic identity. And we do it through objects, people, and events. Okay. And that's absolute, that's universal. You can use that 500 BC, 500 AD. You can use it in uh, the Brazilian rainforest. It doesn't matter. Doesn't Everyone, matter what culture, what, exactly. what century. That's why I love it so much. It's absolute and universal. All right, I'm you having fun now. I'm now having fun know, now. Yeah, now since I know that, okay, I'm back to, I would look at the things in your room and know, put them together and say, I have an idea of what theme this person is. The next thing I do is I start asking you questions. And in those questions, you're going to put ideas together in a thematic way that will designate love, justice, wisdom, or power for me. And therefore, I would have the language to respond to you, whereby I would be also become a, a member of your symbology. Hmm. Wow. So when you started really digging into all of this, was this during obviously those 20 years of building up that new sales career or is this, this is after all that, like no, this is, no, this is your newest okay. book, right? Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. That, that's, uh, that's the newest and the only. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to screen share been, for that too. 
So yeah. here's your here's your site, ladies and gentlemen, johnvoris.com. Book is right on the homepage. There we go. So I like to do some screen sharing and share sure. people's sites, you know, Appreciate it. Yeah. add some visual, you know, aesthetics. So, um, but I mean, this is literally, this is basically your life's work then like yes. all your, all your knowledge in one book. <laughs> I love it. Well, what I, yeah, it is. It's the, it's the end result because I wanted to make it so I could teach others mm -hmm. because the way it really began is uh, from uh, epistemology, axiology, praxeology, forensics, so you see, people don't want to know that for sure. So what <laughs> I do, I, yeah, I read the books others don't need to read. That's uh, that's the other. Uh, well, I mean, for the, for the listeners, he's got two giant stacks like pillars behind his head. So, and whereas I got the shelf behind me too. But I mean, yes, you could definitely tell you've done some research. <laughs> oh yes. Well, on that note, my my room is full of over four thousand books right now. The oh, is that all? Okay. Yeah, that's well. it. And then, and I have downstairs as a basement. I have another 2000 and I have two sheds that are 12 by 24 uh, filled with books. So you've held on to every book. You've never gotten rid of them. I, I don't think I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, I'm, you know, John, I'm always thinking about that. This is slightly off topic, but it, it's on yeah. point. It's like, you know, I actually, I have given away a couple of books. I've had authors on like yourself and sometimes the assistant passed in the wind with the uh, publisher and next thing you know, they might send me two. So if I end up getting two, then I, I always hand one off. I'd rather, oh, yeah, two, if there's yeah. listeners in my audience and I can pass on some knowledge and they don't have to pay a couple of bucks, great, here you guys go. Like, cause I want them to learn, right? So, but I've always thought about them like, you know, my, my bookcase is always filling up. I have to unload it and bring in new books that, that arrive. And I was like, what if I just start giving them out there? Or I end up like you and I have like four to 6,000 books on hand or whatever the total is. So. Well, uh, see, I do the research. That's all yeah. I do. I, in other words, I've, I've created probably uh, a dozen workshops and seminars. Wow. And um, more than that. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's really quite a bit. And, and the, you, your other question, your beginning question was, did I, does the book represent all of the 20 years? Sure. The book represents really the, the last aspect of all that I learned. I began with reading objects. Mm. That's how I began. So I sold reading objects and, and seeing what type of theme someone was. Okay. But I can also read how they learn, uh, how they, have relate, how they uh, approach relationships, and how they uh, uh, produce. What are the, what's the production that they really want to get across? What I mean by that is some people are after abstract or uh, physical results. Okay. And the two makes a big difference because if you're married and one's physical and one's abstract, they have a communication issue. Definitely. Yeah. So when I met a prospect, I'd also have to determine if they're physical or abstract result because how I describe my widget determined how, what I saw in that person. So I could describe it in, in terms of ideology or a physical aspect more on an empirical level. So I, I never heard it in your words this way before, but obviously this is, that's one of the biggest things I got out of the five love languages was studying that. And where I my, my wife is a doctor. So she, she's just wired differently than me. You know, I'm a business brain, but um, I, that's one thing I realized if I had to translate, I would believe that she's abstract and I'm physical because what I've learned from the five love languages was the same way. Whereas if she doesn't care if I physically give her anything, it's a matter of me just following through and making sure that I do what I say I'm going to do. And that's easy for me. I'm, I'm a, I'm a closer, man. I get things done. <laughs> uh, but for me, you know, it would be nice to have her like physically do something. You know, uh, I actually cook more than she does, but it'd be nice if I came home and like ha had a meal waiting for me. I was like, Oh, look at that. That's, that's, that's Very nice. Good. You know? Yes. So what I do <laughs> when I do an assessment, which is uh, 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 what I've been doing assessments now since uh, 2013, it's like a personality profile test on steroids. Yeah. Um, so what, when I do that in that two hours, I, one of the aspects I discover is whether they're physical or abstract and to resonate with what you just said, I'm physical, I'm an abstract and my, my wife's physical. So gotcha. she will go and get my cleaning physical and bring it home and that's how she shows affection. I'll call up and say, would you like to go out to dinner tonight? I'm creating a, a, an abstract atmosphere. And so that's how we communicate. But then when I go home, she says, you don't do anything, right? <laughs> and I say, you never invite me out to dinner, right? Uh, it's classic. And it is classic, but then once you get what you're really after is a physical and abstract result, 
then I know now that I consciously do things to satisfy that side of her. And she consciously picks up the phone and says, let's go out to dinner to uh, offset what she really doesn't want to do and what I really don't want to do. It's not my, my nature to do these things, mm. but we just do it so we can complement each other. And, well, and I think what you're works. pointing out is kind of what I already said, which is I think yeah. a lot of us don't take the time to get those extra details. I mean, I personally, as you and I are recording this right now, I've not even married a year yet. <laughs> so I waited to my 40s to get married. I've never been in a, this is the longest, most committed relationship I've ever had. So I was like, hey, if I'm going to do it, let's just, let's do it right. But I'm still, I went ahead and I didn't do the five love languages or get back into the psych stuff until the marriage. And now I'm doing it more because I want to ensure that we don't make some of these mistakes because we're not self-aware of right. how we differ. And it's okay to differ. I think a lot of people are like, oh my God, we're just too different. There's nothing wrong with that. What are your thoughts? I mean, you've studied this more than I have. Differences are good as long as you understand them, right? Not only that, but your power is in your uniqueness. This is another issue I have. People come to me with a lot of anxiety. Mm. And the anxiety is about choices. And when you're five years old, people are asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you're not mature enough to say, I want to be me. You never think know. of that. Yeah. You know? And so, they, you know, your dad was an accountant. Maybe you should get into accountancy. And your mother was a nurse. Maybe you should be a nurse. And so you start thinking in that direction because you don't know any better. And then you have teachers telling you the same thing. And, and your friends are doing the same thing. But by the time you're uh, 17, you're supposed to know what you want. And you don't. And so you make a decision based on that, appeasing other people, and then you go into that uh, uh, career. You're not all that happy, uh, and you're 35, and you're going through a midlife tri uh, crisis. It happens so often. Yeah. And so what I do, with, especially with 17, 18-year-olds, year, I take them through an assessment. It's about two hours. And they find exactly their life theme, and they find exactly what they need to be doing. I mean, the range, which is the range of what they need to be doing. And, and the life changes for them. They don't make the mistakes that other people make. Do you and find, it really does stop that. Do you find, and this is not a matter of assigning a label or anything else, but I've noticed this. So there's a lot of, is it, I don't know if you want to go with frustration. I, I call it, um, it's not frustration. It's lack of understanding of the generational differences, right? So I'm Gen X. There's the people that are on the cusp of Gen X and millennials. And then obviously there's a lot of hoopla out there right now about the millennial generation and now the Z generation coming up. So I think I found in the business world, especially there's a lot of people who just don't understand how the younger generation, the millennials, for example, are motivated and inspired. And that's honestly, that's part of the target audience of this show is that I want to make sure that our generations you know, older than me, my age or younger, we're all passing on knowledge and better understanding. So this is, is this going to benefit not just the Gen Xers, but also the baby boomers and the millennials with understanding. So do you find that the millennial generation now is more misunderstood or they are so driven that they want to mean something or do something or stand for something uh, that they're struggling more than maybe the prior generations with decisions like this? Well, what's happening is uh, the, the complaint I hear is a lack of critical thinking. Aha. Uh -huh. It okay. is. And, but there's a reason for that. Uh, they, uh, they wanted to push kids through the school system. Yes. And they made everything simpler, simpler. And so part of that is read the book, but when you have a test, it's open book. You can, you can just read it. Which take blows my test mind. from the book. Blows, I never had open book test. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Yeah. How about how about you're allowed to take your calculator to your math class, math test? Uh, the only time when we were allowed to use that, actually, no, not in the final test, unless you were doing. Gra I was I originally was an engineer, so I had to do graphical mm -hmm. analysis, and we did have to have a special scientific calculator for that. But no, any standard mathematical course, trigonometry, calculus, no calculators were allowed. We had to figure all that out. Mm -hmm. So, well, so I've that's that's what I've had yeah, teachers tell me, and. Um, so the issue is also they tell you what you need to know and repeat it on the test. And the idea was to get kids passing tests, not yeah. learning. Thank you. That I agree with this. That is very common. Yeah. Very common. And it's a, it's so a end, shame. It's not the student's no. fault. No, they no, don't. it's not. No. It's, it's it, the system. brilliant. It's yeah, the system. exactly. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's terrible. But I just wanted to comment on something. Uh, I want you to consider the possibility, the reason why you waited a long time to get married. Yeah. 
is because you, you, you're, I think either you are a wisdom person or you're a justice person with high wisdom. Wisdom people take a very long t time to make decisions because they always want to know and they want to know about knowing. Mm -hmm. They want to know that they know that they know and it never stops. And that's what stalls everything for wisdom. People. Is that what knowledge seeker falls under? Uh, yes. Uh, then I'm probably more wisdom, I'm probably wisdom then because I'm, I'm voracious that way. I mean, I, right. I'm listening to audiobooks and podcasts on a regular basis because right. I don't have enough time to sit down and physically read because I do so much. But yeah, I'm always consuming, always consuming. Right. Yeah. Right. And so as a wisdom person there in my book, in fact, I, I, I show people who you get along with and why who you don't get along with and why and and how that how all of that creates a dynamic in your life that is controlling you and once you read the book you can control it that's the difference i'm intrigued now now, now you got me thinking trying to figure out what my wife is <laughs> uh, she's a doctor uh uh, she's a doctor. She's an equine vet doctor. Yes. So she's a large animal veterinary doctor, went to Cornell and UPenn. And she's also a doctor of chiropractic for animals as well. So um, she did a lot of education. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a guess because I do this as well. By knowing who you are, I can get an idea of who she is. I think she's a justice person with high wisdom. I could see the, that. The reason why is because she has a lar large love quadrant section. Yeah. See, justice people are a combination of love and wisdom. Okay. Because justice itself has two aspects, a sentimentality and facts. Think of the law. Oh, she's a fact person. And facts. Sentimentality uh, and facts. Here, maybe this will help seal it for you. Yeah. While we were dating, uh -huh. I would get frustrated because, I mean, I'm always not pie in the, you know, not head in the sky, but I love seeing the potential of the future, you know, vision, vision and everything else. Right. And I, I think big, that's what I do. That's why I, that's why I succeed and continue to succeed. We still make mistakes, but I keep, I'm more successful now than I was in the past because I keep going. Um, her common response was, well, I'm a realist. So that I can't tell you how many times I've heard that word realist realism. It's concrete. It's, you know, it's clean. And maybe that's her doctor brain. I don't know, but does that help you at all? <laughs> yeah. She's a pragmatist. Oh yeah. So she's looking it uh, could be uh, looking for uh, pragmatic results. Mm -hmm. okay? But uh, when you take knowledge and uh, sentimentality together, that creates back to justice, okay. justice people. Uh, and uh, that r makes perfect sense because uh, also because that you both have an aspect, you have more, your, your drive for wisdom is stronger, but she, but she also has a very strong, uh, attraction to wisdom as well. Yes, she definitely and, consumes as much, yes. if not more, than me. Although yes. I don't agree with some of the stuff she consumes, but hey, that's her choice. Got it. But, <laughs> but she, she consumes also, a lot. Yeah, she cares a lot mm -hmm. in areas that you think, well, why, why are you in that direction? I can understand it why you care, but no, I don't care that much in that area, whatever it might be. Right. Like you care for animals, but uh, she'll probably care a lot more for animals than you might in yeah. certain circumstances. And same as with me, uh, I care for animals, but I'm not obsessed about it. A, do a veterinarian is going to be far more obsessed. Oh my God. Our, our dog, dear Lord. I mean, I, I joke around. I, th I, I said, she's like a stage four clinger with our dog. <laughs> so, whereas I'm like, Hey, yeah, he's our dog. He's my best friend. I'll hug him. I'll pet him, but like she'll lay on him. I mean, there's a lot of love right there. <laughs> sure. I, I definitely come actually in our wedding vows. Uh, she made a point that I come second behind Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> our, our Calvin the Coonhound comes first. So I got it. Yeah. All right. So, so now what I've demonstrated a little bit for you is how I can look into the two of you and your lives and at least begin by a very general idea of who, who you people are. Yeah. That's now if I can do that, and I don't need, and I'm I'm just a few minutes into this program. Imagine what I could, what my my uh, uh, pro, my uh, clients do when they use this information. When it comes to selling real estate, when it comes to selling really anything, when yeah. it comes to I have psychologists to deal with relationships with people, and I'm also working with an attorney. I'm trying. Uh, it works with jury selection, by the way. Oh, interesting. And so, yeah. Oh, yes. And so there's many aspects because once you get what it motivates someone the rest all falls together. 
I'm also working with someone who is investments. When you have someone invest in uh, something that does not conform to their identity and they lose money, they have a good chance of suing you. But if yes. you sell them something that does in fact conform to their authentic identity, people are uh, more prone to take responsibility for their own decision. Well, and if and they I, lose money, it's their decision. And so that makes a big difference. It definitely does. And actually, it's funny you bring all that up because I've had some financial experts on the show and they talk about how if you're going to start doing your, you know, taking accountability for your own investing and do, a lot of people doing their own self-investing, you know, online mm -hmm. programs, everything else. And, mm -hmm. and they actually said, go ahead and do that. But make sure you get involved with funds or investments that relate to you because they're more comfortable. You're actually going to understand what's going on. Like, why would you go and invest in some blah, blah, blah that your buddy told you about, which you have no clue about, has nothing to do with your lifestyle, your professional history, where you're going with your life, everything. It's like, that is that one decision they said will just stress you out and bother you because you don't understand it. They actually said the most successful investments can always relate to who you are, what you do, where you're going, because you, you connect with it. Now, obviously you're saying it in a different way, but because back to your point, and I'll screen share it on your website, for motivating results, it literally comes down to, is it physical or is it abstract, as you said, right? Yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, and as far as the uh, investments, what yeah. I discovered is uh, the love people uh, do best with bonds. Uh, your wisdom people do best with stocks. Power people uh, are into real estate and justice people are into commodities. And that's where they'll do the best. That is hilarious because I'm stocks, my wife's bonds. So it totally tiles there back you to go. what you guys said. Like, I'm there you, see, see, yeah. that, see how this works? <laughs> it's an amazing thing. But I, I, I made this discovery by reading autobiographies from very wealthy people in bonds, stocks, commodities, and real estate. That is um, wild. And, stock, and that's how I came up with that. And it that works. It, I mean, I, I say jokingly, oh, that's crazy. But in a positive way, like, that's crazy how accurate that can really connect over. Right. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now I, something else on your site, and I know we're going to be coming close to the end of our time because I want to make sure I got this on here because I do have another show right behind yours is I was still on your, on your authentic identity assessment where you outline everything you do. And I like this section here in the middle where you re reference a, a life theme, how people have an authentic self, a synthetic self, and then you, you hint on rejuvenation or re rejuvenator. Can you explain a little mm -hmm. more about that component? Sure. Um, if I, uh, are, are there skis behind you? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, we're huge skiers. Yes. Okay. So. so that, so that makes sense. Okay. And the reason why it does, because you're a wisdom person. Okay. Yeah. So in order to rejuvenate, you have to get away from having the need to know. You have to engage in what I call the chaos and the unknown for at least a little while. Oh, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I will yes. do. I, I jump out of planes. I was a ski yeah. race coach for 11 years. We just got back from Vail, Colorado, two weeks ago, and we're leaving for yes. Utah in the next two weeks skiing. Yes. Okay. So a wisdom person has to escape knowing and having to know, and the way they do that is they engage in their brand of chaos and the unknown. So I know that that section of who you are is present. Okay? Oh, this is so accurate. <laughs> So the next is the authentic means that that's the essence of who you are. The synthetic is the synthesis of what you've learned. Hmm. And that's another identity. In fact, somebody, some call them, call it uh, your learning from dialogism. From the cultural dialogue, you have another persona that's out there. And that's your personality, by the way. The oh. personality is how you express yourself. How? Okay. The authenticity is the why. So you have the cause and the effect. Okay. okay. So uh, when it comes to um, uh, the personality, it's, uh, you'll notice that you have similarities with one of your parents. Okay. And you'll notice that it's your, the personality is the similarity. You're very, can be very, very different people essentially. But on the other hand, uh, you, your, your behavioralism can be, uh, very similar between the two of them. So the idea is this, we might live in a physical world of objects, 
but we live and die for the invisible world of ideas, abstract ideas. Hmm. That's what drives us. And that's what the European study. Sci science in this country, America, in America, they're focused on uh, uh, experimentation, uh, empirical evidence, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and compiling uh, data. Europe is about what does it mean to be human? And do, you, you see, do you find that's because of their history? You know, obviously, yes. culturally, they go back way further. You know, our, our modern, our, you know, the United States of America came much later. So, yes. Yeah. Well, the other, yeah. The, so we were about inventions mm -hmm. and it was just the time of the era uh, of the world, you might say. We came in the Industrial Revolution. Of course, mm -hmm. that was in Europe as well. But we really focused on uh, uh, entrepreneurship. And the Europeans for quite a while couldn't because of the king situation and religion, sure. et cetera. So that's, that had to do a lot, a lot with it. Uh, is, uh, we're more of an inventive uh, culture. I, I do find uh, that Europe, I think, uh, is just held on to the history a lot better. They, they respect the cultural history and diversity, yeah. I think, a lot more. Maybe it is yeah. because they just have much older roots, I think. Well, so. the other uh, is uh, they were uh, influenced by uh, phenomenology hmm. and epistemology from Europe, Germany, and France, uh, okay. uh, and 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 that stuck. Uh, Heidegger uh, is you know is is a god in Europe, and uh, Sartre, France, and these people all clung to what does it mean to be human? What is the human element? What does it mean to be? And hmm. so, uh, you know, in this country, it's all about science, science physical evidence. And that's a good thing sure. because they make fantastic discoveries too. But when it comes into the human element, something's missing because I cannot test your mind. I can well, only surmise your mind from what you do, but what you do is not who you're being. I'm focused on who you're being. That's why the book is called Discover the Power That Drives Your Personality. Your personality is the way you do the power that drives it is the way you're being while you're doing. Okay. This is a uh, very open. I, I, I guess I was going to say eye opening, but I almost feel like it's mind opening. <laughs> oh, it's very different. It, it's only it, mainly it's different because there's a couple of reasons. One, it comes from Europe. And so, uh, you know, people in this country believe that their marketplace holds all what's available and it's not true. Mm -hmm. Great deal is not in this country. And so when you, when you go through seminars and workshops and they don't work for you, consider the possibility that there's another way of learning that's not available in this country. And that's an absolute fact. That's a fact. And I am proof of it. Hmm. I never was able to sell using what's in this country. And, but others are. I want to make very clear. There are great people out here teaching, and they do have absolute results. But everyone's different. All, All right. my clients are people who took personality profile tests. They took workshops and just didn't work for them. Yeah. And, and I get them on a different track. That's what I'm doing. So the reason why this is so different is because it is from Europe. And this started off from a scientific perspective, meaning every new prospect was an experiment. And I did that for 20 years. Wow. So you basically did a physical. massive... A massive N1 experiment across yeah. years of your mm -hmm. career and then yes. just compiled all the data. Yes. And once you did it enough times, it's no longer an N1 experiment. Yes. And then I were able to put it under was theory, but this is not theory for me any longer. They love just wisdom and power is not theory. Uh, it's I've, I've been able to link the empirical fact with the theoretical. And I did that through 20 years of experience. And so now I'm able to give people answers that they're, before they weren't able to find. And, and the other issue I want to say is that it, it may be said that, you know, I think therefore I am like Rene Descartes, right? I think yep. therefore I am, but I am not where I think. Hmm. Well said. Where you think is beneath that. And that is what I open up for people. So you're helping people dig deeper. They, yeah. they, they, need, they need to unlock that next level that they haven't found. Yeah. And it's very simple to do just by asking things like, uh, you describe the last time you were upset. They'll give me an answer. Well, give me the, uh, describe the last time you were happy. They'll give me an answer. And since they only have one need, which is to express their authentic identity, it doesn't matter what you, what makes you angry, what makes you happy are tethered to who you are. 
And by asking those two questions, I could find it. That's pretty eye-opening. <laughs> I have to go back to eye-opening. That's just, that's, I, I gotta say, I mean, just on today's episode, you totally opened my eyes. I, and I connected on it. I mean, you connected on me. Oh, and we didn't even sit down and go well, through one of your normal assessments. So, no, yeah. But I want to thank you because you are a wisdom person. I'm very happy for that. <laughs> and so that really, because that means you're curious and you're open to new ideas and uh, you're intelligent and you will absorb what I'm talking about. Uh, not necessarily because of that reason, but a love person can be have an IQ of 190. That's not the issue. The mm -hmm. issue is their focus on caring and love only. And they kind right. of dismiss a lot of other things. And so a wisdom person is the same thing. They're looking for facts and information. Yeah, they understand sentimentality, but they don't put it as high on, on a priority list as facts and ideas. That's all it is. It's not a right or wrong, good or bad. Oh, good clarification. I like how you put that in. It's just true. There is no right or wrong here. I think, yeah. that, I think that's a great thing coming out of this. A lot of people start assigning blame or whatever. It's like, no, no, there's no blame. There's no, well, I'm better than no. you. It's just, we're just no. trying to understand each other better. In fact, if you took any one of those quadrants out of a society, it would fall. What if one day it would fall, fall apart? Because we, all need, we all need those types to balance each other. Yes, absolutely. And countries can also be associated with love, justice, wisdom, and power. Hmm. Cities can. Neighborhoods can. Well, at, at their roots, each and every single human being on the planet has these four domains yes. at different strengths. Yes. Yes. Well, cities and countries are comprised of them. So yes, yeah. So so now let's take it another step. So if you're a politician and you're going to give yeah. a speech, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. And you know the authentic that drives your 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 people. Your demographic. And, yes, and then you know how to language that. Mm -hmm. So if you're a professional uh, speech writer, this would be huge for how yes. you do your job and your career because yes. you are playing to these, these, these components. Yes, now there's a lot of marketeers that are already doing that, but they're marketing, uh, but they're not doing it to polit politics. They're not making it personal. No. Yeah, they stay with an ideology. And so what I've done again is bring the ide ideology down to the grassroots of everyday life. Wow, that's pretty wild. I like it. Listen, I want to actually, I'm gonna do one more screen share because when I have authors on, I have an Amazon influencer page that is linked to our site, livethefuel.com. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I created a list and I got to make sure I add you to the books list. So book recommendations. So now you've been added. <clears throat> well, Pardon me. You. And I got to make sure I add this to my cart because I'm totally going to read this. So, because um, I don't have this one yet. So, uh, but, uh, listen, John, I've had a blast today. I do have to get ready for another show, but before I have you go, I ask my guest co-host to leave behind some all encompassing final words. And you, you have a great backstory, man, 20 years of professional experience. And you chose to take time to understand the psychology, obviously European based, uh, and also the philosophy behind all of this to try and pass on something. So I, I call this a legacy message. I'm, I'm pretty excited by that. I've realized that myself, maybe because of wisdom that over the years, me podcasting, that it's not just about having a voice, but what am I passing on, right? What is the legacy I'm leaving behind? And now I realize that now because I'm finishing my first book as well. So it's, it's been a lot of eye opening things for myself in the past couple of years, but for you as the guest co-host today, is, is there some all encompassing words or a legacy message behind all of this you want to leave behind for listeners in case they forgot everything else we, you and I just talked about. <laughs> well, once you, once you know your, your life theme, you realize there's no one to blame, only something to be aware of. There's nothing Ooh. to fix. There's only something to be aware of. So the power here is awareness. Yeah, that's it. And once people are aware, physical versus abstract results, for example, the arguments that couples have go away. Uh-huh. Another one is careers. Once they understand what really drives them, all that anxiety goes away. Because they now start working towards the true path that they actually right. should have been on. And they weren't, maybe yes. they weren't there yet. That's right. So there's nothing to fix in them just to be aware of their uniqueness. And mm. that's the issue. And I also want to say that it's very frustrating for me 
when I see intelligent people have quite often most of the problems because they've all, always been the odd man out. They've always been the, the smartest one in the room. They've always been alone. They've always uh, thought, uh, felt that what they think is different than everyone else, that they don't have any connection. And that's very hard for them to do. Many people are like that, the intelligent ones. And mm -hmm. I, I, when I have an assessment with them and, and they see that, then a lot of the problems they had when they were in high school, et cetera, and the relationships, now they see what they really were. Mm -hmm. There was just a miscommunication because they were the smartest one in the room. You know, I've always said that. I said, I, I've known some very intelligent people and they always had some social awkwardness to them mm -hmm. because they knew that they were the smartest room in the room, maybe for what they know, uh, yeah. but they didn't have the ability to connect. And right. like, I'm a social butterfly. I've, I've adapted mm -hmm. throughout my entire life. I was, mm -hmm. I tell you all the time, uh, I was a type B person. I was actually a quiet kid when I was a kid. And then mm -hmm. I grew and embraced my, my, that's why I'm a sales and marketing professional and I do public speaking and I have a podcast show and everything else because as my wife says, I have the gift of gab to a fault sometimes. <laughs> but if I hadn't found this path, I wouldn't even know what I would have been like when I was younger. It could have been a whole different world and it, would not, it probably would not have been a happy one. Uh, I want you to think to yourself the possibility that you're a holistic thinker. Hmm. So that when ideas come to you, I think of a, a of a, uh, say a wheel, a wagon wheel, and there's spokes. And these are all these ideas coming in in your mind. Mm -hmm. And so you're in the center and you're grabbing all this. And sometimes you get overwhelmed uh, yes. because there is so much. And that's the distinction between you and your wife as well, because I'm that because she's linear. Mm -hmm. And so you come up with all these ideas, but this en energizes your creativity, but also it, it establishes why you've had so many careers. Well, and I've, it's funny, you, you call it, uh, you call it a holistic? Yeah. So I took an assessment years ago and they said I was a spatial thinker. Like they said, okay. picture a cloud of ideas. You could take it and break it all apart and see everything mm -hmm. and then apply a process and then yeah. funnel it down. That'll so work. they said mm -hmm. I was a spatial thinker. So, mm -hmm. so that, is that on the same path? Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but yes, I, I would totally agree with you. <laughs> but I don't have to give you a test to do that. You see? I could talk to you in a matter of minutes and get that. Yeah. But again, to your point, imagine once you get it through a full assessment process, yeah. do a mm -hmm. deep dive, oh, yeah. uh, you could really get a lot of content out of that. So, Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's pretty cool. Well, listen, John, hang tight. I want to give probably a goodbye off the air. Ladies okay. and gentlemen, uh, you, you might have learned a little bit more about me, your host today. <laughs> again, we don't edit anything. We don't, uh, we don't script anything. This was all just off the cuff because John was that good of a guest co-host and he was that good at getting to know me. Imagine what he could do to get to know you. So again, check him out, ladies and gentlemen. We'll have everything linked on livethefuel.com. Again, his site is John, J-O-H-N, Voris, V-O-R-I-S.com. If you do use my influencer page on Amazon, linked at livethefuel.com, click on it. It'll take you right to the book recommendations and you'll see the book. I just added it. So ladies and gentlemen, whether it's love, whether it's justice, whether it's wisdom, whether it's power, Check out the book, Discover the Power That Drives Your Personality. We're here to fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. John helped us do that today. So thanks for tuning in. And remember, you too can live the fuel. And we'll talk to you guys again soon. And recording is clear. Facebook Live, right. just I leave it on for an extra few seconds for fun. So, but I hope you had some fun. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that was good. That was good. Yes, good. you did. Oh, yeah, of course, you did very well. That's what you do. <laughs> Um, but I also uh, want to throw in something uh, for you. Um, uh, what I'm doing is I'm actively looking for partners or people who are into public uh, speaking. And the reason why is because I really do. I'm a researcher. Oh. That's what I do. And so there's a lot that I have available, but I don't have the fan base. Okay. Well, right so now, like I said, this is still streaming on Facebook, which means I'm streaming this to my Live the Fuel page and to my private, uh, the Fuel Tank Facebook groups. You're getting exposure there right now. And then okay. obviously you'll have it on your page. But uh, besides myself, you may pick up a few more people. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, they, so if it's myself or others, they should reach back out to you uh, for this research you're doing? Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm telling you directly that yeah. are we, we're not being recorded now.
Oh, no. No, it's not recorded. Oh, okay. But no, yeah, this is on Facebook. Yeah, I told you. But we, we stopped recording and I leave oh, the stream God. up because the, the, the video is supposed to be behind the scenes and more out there. So right oh, now, okay. people can see that you and I are real, real people. Oh, okay. um, but yeah. I'm going sh to shut it down now because I do have to get the video ready for another show anyway. So thanks for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, get ready for the next podcast. <laughs> and we are clear. So